Today, you're going to learn the best way to understand native English speakers. Do you know what it is? The best way is to practice listening to native speakers and to expand your vocabulary with natural expressions. And that's what you'll do today. Welcome back to J4's English. Of course, I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. Here's how this lesson will work. I'm going to say a sentence three times and you need to write down exactly what you hear in the comments. And I'm going to talk fast and use natural expressions. And this listening test will progress from beginner to more advanced. Let's get started. I'll say it three times. You're on a roll. You're on a roll. You're on a roll. Did you get this one? I said, you're on a roll. Notice that contraction, you're. This is you are. And native speakers, we pronounce this very unstressed. You're, 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 you're on a. Notice how on a sounds like one word because I use that N from on. I transfer it to a, on a, na. But I have to say it as one word, on a, on a. You're on a roll. You're on a roll. I'm you're on a roll. Yes. What does this mean? This is a great expression because when you're on a roll, it means you're experiencing a period of continuous success or good fortune. So this is a very positive thing. In the sports world, if a sports team wins five games in a row, which means consecutively one after the other, that team would be on a roll. Or in the workplace, let's say Muhammad has a sales job and Muhammad made five sales today. He's on a roll because you need the verb to be. He is as a contraction. He's. He's on a roll. He's on a roll. Or how about you? If you pass this listening test, the next one, the next one, and the next one in this lesson, you can say, I pass all four listening tests. I'm on a roll. I'm on a roll. Or you could say, I have studied English every day this month. So that continuous success one after the other. I've studied English every day this month. I'm on a roll. And notice that verb tense. I've studied. I have studied. This is the present perfect. And it's being used because it's an unfinished time reference. So if I say this month, it means the month is still in progress. Maybe it's the 20th or 23rd. So put, I'm on a roll, I'm on a roll, because you're watching this lesson, and I'm sure you've watched other English lessons, hopefully mine, this week. So you can say, I'm on a roll. Put that in the comments. Are we on a roll or are we on a roll? Our next listening exercise, a little more difficult. I'll say it three times. I'm not a fan of sports. I'm not a fan of sports. I'm not a fan of sports. Did you get this one? I said, I'm not a fan of sports. Notice that contraction, I'm, I am, I'm. Not a can be linked together, so said as one word. But notice that T is between two vowels, so I'm going to pronounce it as a soft D. Nada, the, nada, nada. I'm not a fan of. So I can combine fan of together, fan of. But I need to take that N and transfer it to the next sound. Nov, nov, fan of. I'm not a fan of sports. I'm not a fan of sports. This has a very simple meaning. To be a fan of something or someone means you like it. You like that something or you like that someone. What about you? Are you a fan of American football? Which in North America, we just call football, but to avoid confusion for you, are you a fan of American football, the NFL? To reply on the negative side, you can say, I'm not at all a fan. So this means you really dislike sports or American football. I'm not at all a fan. A little less negative, I'm not a fan. I dislike it, but not really dislike it. I dislike American football. I'm a fan 
I'm a huge fan. I'm a giant fan. If you love American football. So which one describes you? Put it in the comments. For me, I would say I'm not at all a fan. I would rather watch football, soccer than American football, which we call football. Now remember, you can use this expression with something or someone. For example, I'm a fan of Taylor Swift, and of course that means her music, what she does. I'm a fan of Taylor Swift. I'm a fan of Elon Musk. Or sports, something. I'm a fan of yoga, biking. Technology is a great something. I'm a fan of Google Drive. Personally, I'm a huge fan of Google Drive. I love it. I'm a fan of Amazon. I'm a fan of Android. Whatever you want, so you can get a lot of use out of this expression. Oh, oh. I just wanted to tell you, I'm a huge fan. I'm I'm a huge fan. Not a sports fan, huh? Are you enjoying this lesson? If you are, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers from TV, the movies, YouTube, and the news, so you can improve your listening skills of fast English, expand your vocabulary with natural expressions, and learn advanced grammar easily. Plus, you'll have me as your personal coach. You can look in the description for the link to learn more, or you can go to my website and click on Finally Fluent Academy. Now let's continue with our lesson. Our next listening exercise. I'll say it three times. You really hit the jackpot. You really hit the jackpot. You really hit the jackpot. Did you get this one? I said you really hit the jackpot. Now native speakers, we often pronounce you as a very unstressed ya.、Yeah, you really, you really, you really, you really hit. Notice I don't say hit. And pronounce that T because it forces me to take a pause. Hit the so you don't really hear the T. This is called a flat T. Hit the jackpot. Now, when you hit the jackpot, it means you win the lottery, which is an awesome thing. Woohoo! I hit the jackpot. But outside of the context of the lottery, when you hit the jackpot. It means you achieve a highly desirable or fortunate outcome, and it's by chance. Just like when you win the lottery, when you hit the jackpot, it's by chance. They just pull a number, and by chance, it's your number. You hit the jackpot. So when you use this expression outside of the lottery, it's also by chance. So I could say I love fashion. And my boss just assigned me to the Vogue account. Vogue is a fashion brand, and I get to go to Fashion Week for free. I hit the jackpot. But this suggests that it was just by chance that I was given the Vogue account. It's not because I. Spent weeks preparing a presentation to try to get the account. It was just randomly assigned to me. I hit the jackpot. And just remember those conjugations of hit. It's hit, hit, hit. So very easy to remember. So in the past simple, last week I hit the jackpot when my boss assigned me to the Vogue account. Or I could say I've hit the jackpot. The present perfect I have. I've hit the jackpot with this new account. In this case, the present perfect is for an action, a completed past action that has a result in the present. And here's a true example. My students are absolutely amazing. All of you are so amazing. I truly feel like I've hit the jackpot with such amazing students, especially when I read the comments and everyone is so positive and supportive. I truly feel like I've hit the jackpot. So thank you all. Our final listening exercise and the most challenging listening exercise. I'll say it three times. She really pushes my buttons. She really pushes my buttons. She really pushes my buttons. Did you get this one? I said she really pushes my buttons, and this is the most difficult one because maybe you heard the individual words, but 
Do you know what it means? If someone said this to you, would you be able to reply back? Would you be able to have a conversation? Because this is an advanced idiom that native speakers use. For pronunciation, maybe the word buttons wasn't clear because native speakers, we don't pronounce those T's. I don't say buttons, buttons. That sounds very awkward for me to pronounce. I never, ever say it like that. I always say buttons, 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 buttons. So those T's become flat T's. We don't push out the air. Now you can absolutely say buttons. You can pronounce the T, but it's important that you know how native speakers pronounce it so you can understand us and not be confused when we say buttons. And you can hear that unstressed buttons in this clip. Let's listen now. Button, button, who's got the button? So now that you know how to hear buttons, let's learn about this expression to push one's buttons. And notice buttons is always plural. This is when you annoy someone on purpose. Now, why would you annoy someone on purpose? Well, you have maybe a sister, a brother, a best friend, a husband, a wife, a mom and dad, and you probably know how to push their buttons. You know how to get a reaction out of them. And let's be honest, sometimes you do it on purpose, right? So let's say you have a sibling, your mom could say to you, why do you always push your sister's buttons? So notice your sister's buttons. The buttons belong to your sister, so you need the possessive there. And your mom is saying, why do you always purposely annoy your sister? And maybe you push her buttons by talking about her ex-boyfriend. And you know just the mention of his name really irritates her. But you do it on purpose to get that reaction. Let's be honest, we've all done something like this. There are always little rivalries in the workplace as well. So someone could say, she's just trying to push my buttons, but it won't work. So she's saying someone else is trying to annoy her on purpose, but she's going to ignore it. It won't work. And maybe this other coworker is doing this by talking about the Vogue account that she lost. Remember, she hit the jackpot with the Vogue account, but then she forgot to do something and they fired her from the account. So she's not going to fashion week and she's not working on the Vogue account. So just talking about the Vogue account really creates a reaction in her. This happens a lot. Let's say you have two friends. One of them supports this sports team and the other friend supports this sports team and their rivals and simply talking about the other sports team gets that person really upset and annoyed. So you could say, I know how to push Alexander's buttons. Just mention how France lost the World Cup. He pushes my buttons. This kid is pushing my buttons really knows how to push buttons. Now let's do an imitation exercise so you can practice all these natural pronunciation changes. I'll say each sentence again three times, but this time after I say it, I want you to repeat it out loud. Here we go. You're on a roll. You're on a roll. You're on a roll. I'm not a fan of sports. I'm not a fan of sports. I'm not a fan of sports. You really hit the jackpot. You really hit the jackpot. You really hit the jackpot. She really pushes my buttons. She really pushes my buttons. She really pushes my buttons. It's not a big deal at all. It's not a big deal at all. It's not a big deal at all. Did you get this one? I said, it's not a big deal at all. It's, it's a contraction of it is. Not a, we can combine these together, but notice we have a 
T between two vowels. So a native speaker is going to pronounce that as a soft D and say nada, nada. It's nada, it's nada. Big deal. And then we can do the same with at, with that T and then all. I can put them together and then I'll pronounce that T as a soft D and it sounds like at all, at all, at all, at all. It's not a big deal at all. Let's talk about what this means, to be a big deal. This describes something that's important, serious, or significant. We use this in both positive and negative situations. For example, when you do something and the consequences are serious in a bad way. Getting caught plagiarizing is a big deal. You could be expelled. So here the consequences are serious in a negative way. You could be expelled, which means permanently removed from your school. Is that that big of a deal? Yes, it's a big deal. But we also use this in a positive way. Getting a promotion is a big deal. You can finally buy a house. So here, the promotion is important and significant for the impact it will have on your life. It's a big deal. No big deal, it's a huge deal. Now remember our example was in the negative. It's not a big deal at all. So we can use this in two ways. First, to say that something isn't serious, significant, or important. For example, Missing the party isn't a big deal. Your friend will understand. So the consequence of that action, missing the party, isn't very important or significant or serious. It's really not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Now we also use this as a reply when someone offers appreciation or their thanks for something we did. Your friend could say, thanks for agreeing to help me move this weekend. I really appreciate it. And you can reply back and say, it's not a big deal at all. I'm happy to help. Now, if you want to sound really American and casual, you can reduce that entire sentence to two words, no biggie, no biggie. So no biggie represents it's not a big deal, no biggie. Ah, uh, no biggie. It's really common with native speakers in a casual, informal way. So I could show my appreciation to you and say thank you so much for liking this video and subscribing. Don't forget to do those two things. And then you can reply back and say, no biggie, no biggie. It's not a big deal at all. I'm happy to. So put that in the comments. No biggie, no biggie, no biggie. Put that in the comments. Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. So what are you into? So what are you into? So what are you into? I said, so what are you into? What are can combine together and that are can sound very reduced. What are, what are, what are. So in what are, what are. What are. So basically, I'm forming a contraction in spoken English, although this does not exist as a contraction, is what we do in spoken English. So what are, you can become more of an unstressed ya yeah or ya, yeah, ya, yeah, ya, yeah, almost identical in pronunciation. What are ya yeah, into? So you can take into and change it to into. I didn't do that personally, but many native speakers do. So be prepared to hear to as ta. So what are you into? What are you into? This is a casual way to ask someone about their interests or preferences. So definitely add this to your vocabulary. It will help you sound like a native American speaker. So what exactly are you into, Jesse? To reply, you can say I'm to be into, I am, I'm into plus a noun. I'm into music, art, yoga, photography, hiking, biking, or whatever other activity that you're into. It's also very common to answer what are you into just with a verb of preference and simply say, I like 
music. I love yoga. I adore photography or whatever your interest or preference is. So, what are you into? What about you, Sleeveless? What are you into? Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. Can we play it by ear? Can we play it by ear? Can we play it by ear? Did you get this one? I said, can we play it by ear? Can is an auxiliary verb. It's there to ask the question. When it's an auxiliary verb, we pronounce it as kin, kin, unstressed, because the main verb is what you hear, play. Can you play? Can you play? We can combine play and it together. I'll take that Y and I'll use it to connect. Play it, it, play it, play it. But you say it as one word. Can we play it by ear? Do you know what this means? When you play something by ear, it means that you make decisions as they happen rather than planning in advance. If your friend or spouse asks you, what should we do this weekend? And you don't wanna make plans. You just want to decide as it's happening. So you wait until dinner to decide what you're going to have for dinner rather than planning it in advance the day before. You can say, let's just play it by ear. Let's just play it by ear. You're right, let's play it by ear. Or someone asks, what are you going to do on vacation? Because they know you have a vacation planned. You can reply back and say, we have a few tours planned and we'll play the rest by ear. The rest being the rest of your vacation. We'll play the rest by ear. We'll decide what we want to do in the moment based on how we feel, based on where we are, based on the situation, rather than deciding in advance. What about you? When you're planning a vacation, do you prefer to have a full itinerary? which means every day all the activities you're going to do on that day are decided in advance. That's a full itinerary. Or do you prefer to play it by ear? No plans. You're just going to decide what to do based on how you feel. Or perhaps number three, a little bit of both. So put in the comments your preference, one, two, or three. As for me, I would probably choose number two just to play it by ear. I like being more spontaneous, but my husband, Kevin, he is definitely a full itinerary person, which I learned the first time we planned a vacation together. So now we do number three, we do a little bit of both, so we both are satisfied. What about you? Share yours in the comments. Oh, I don't know, play it by ear, why? Let's try this one more time. I'll say it three times. Turns out I bought a knockoff. Turns out I bought a knockoff. Turns out I bought a knockoff. Did you get this one? Maybe a little more challenging. I said, turns out I bought a knockoff. Turns out I can combine those together and it sounds like turns out. So I'm using that S to glide to the next word, but I say it as one word, turns out. Turns out I bought a, so bought is pronounced bought, so I can combine those together, bada, bada. Just like got a, native speakers commonly say gotta, well you can do the same thing with bought a, bada, bada. Knock, the K is silent, and off, because they go together, knock off, it's one word, I'm going to use that na cough, cough. So I'm going to pronounce the final K on knock, and I'm going to pronounce it on off, na cough, na cough. Let's talk about what this means. Turns out, to turn out, this is an extremely common phrasal verb and is used in many expressions in daily speech. So definitely add it to your vocabulary. In this context, turns out is used to say that something is surprising or unexpected. So I did not expect this situation. Turns out it was spam. So let's say 
you were supposed to work late tonight and you knew about this last week, you've planned your, your entire week to work late today. You've made plans and arrangements, but then your boss says, oh, actually, you don't have to work late tonight. We finished the project. So you can say, oh, turns out I don't have to work late tonight because it's unexpected, it's surprising. It's not what you thought, turns out. Grammatically, there should be a subject here. It turns out I don't have to work late tonight. But this is called a dummy subject in English where the subject it doesn't actually represent anything. It's just the existence, the situation. Because it's a dummy subject in spoken English, we often drop it and just say, turns out I don't have to work late tonight. But in written English, a subject is required grammatically. Let's talk about a knockoff. What is this? Because turns out I bought a knockoff. What's a knockoff? A knockoff is a copy or an imitation of something, usually a product or service. Knockoffs are very common with designer brands. So the original is a Louis Vuitton handbag, which has a very distinct look to it. But there are a lot of knockoffs. They're fake. They're fake Louis Vuittons. And from a distance, you probably can't tell at all. But when you examine the quality of the material, it's very obvious. So in this situation, maybe it's my friend bought a Louis Vuitton, but turns out it was a knockoff. Are these designer or knockoff? Can't you just buy another knockoff? That's actually a cubic zirconia knockoff. Now let's do an imitation exercise so you can practice all of these pronunciation changes that take place in spoken English. I'll say each sentence again three times, and after I say the sentence, I want you to repeat the sentence out loud and imitate my pronunciation. Here we go. It's not a big deal at all. It's not a big deal at all. It's not a big deal at all. So what are you into? So what are you into? So what are you into? Can we play it by ear? Can we play it by ear? Can we play it by ear? Turns out I bought a knockoff. Turns out I bought a knockoff. Turns out I bought a knockoff. Thanks for your help, you rock. Thanks for your help, you rock. Thanks for your help, you rock. Did you get this one? I said, thanks for your help, you rock. Very easy, right? At a natural pace, native speakers, we reduce sound. So for becomes fur, thanks for. Your becomes your. Thanks for your. Thanks for your help, your help. Thanks for your help. Now let's review a common mistake that I hear beginner students make and sometimes even advanced students. You can say thank you or thanks. You cannot say thanks you or thank. And notice in our example, we have thanks for your help. Thanks for your help. What is your help? This is a noun. So we have thanks for plus noun. You can also use thanks for plus gerund because for is a preposition. So what would thanks for your help be in the gerund form? Do you know? Thanks for helping me. Thanks for your help. Thanks for helping me. And you rock. This is a very natural way to say you're great. You're awesome. I use this in the comment section to reply to your lovely comments all the time. But don't say you are rock. It is not to be rock. It is to rock. You rock. You rock. You're awesome. You're really great. You rock. Put that in the comments. You rock. You rock. Thanks for your help. Thanks for helping me. Thanks, Billy. You rock. You rock. Thanks, honey. Let's try this again. A little more difficult. I'll say it three times. She's starting to rub off on you. 
She's starting to rub off on you. She's starting to rub off on you. Did you get this one? I said she's starting to rub off on you. She's is our contraction. She is. She's. She's starting to. So instead of to, you can use an unstressed to. She's starting to rub off. Because rub off is a phrasal verb, they go together, I can take that B sound and connect it to the next word, but I have to combine them together. I have to say them as one word. Rub off, boff, rub off, rub off. I can also take that on and add it together. So I'm saying those three words as one. Rub off on. So here I'm taking the F from off and I'm adding it to on. Fawn, rub off on, rub off on, rub off on you. What does this mean? To rub off on someone is when someone's behavior or personality affects someone else. Let's take Janice and let's say Janice loves helping other people. Now let's say Fernando spends a week working with Janice and now Fernando starts helping other people. You could say Janice rubbed off on Fernando. Here we have it in the past simple, rubbed, rubbed, rubbed off on. Janice rubbed off on Fernando. Now you could also take the specific personality trait or characteristic, in this case Janice's helpfulness which is a noun. Janice's helpfulness, because the helpfulness belongs to Janice, so it's possessive, Janice's helpfulness rubbed off on Fernando. So that specific character trait of Janice transferred to Fernando because they spent time together. Marcus is really rubbing off on you. Finally, I'm rubbing off on you. My deviousness has finally rubbed off on you. Let's try this again. I'll say it three times. He rubs me the wrong way. He rubs me the wrong way. He rubs me the wrong way. Did you get this one? I said, he rubs me the wrong way. Notice this expression uses the verb to rub and our last expression used the verb to rub, but they have completely different meanings. And that's why this is a more advanced listening exercise because maybe you understood the words, but you don't know what this means. To rub someone the wrong way. This is to annoy someone, but without intending to. Remember Janice from our last example and she was very helpful, but maybe for some reason she just rubs you the wrong way. She annoys you, but there's nothing that she does to annoy you, just maybe your personalities clash. They don't go together. So if you're planning a social gathering, you might say, is it okay if we don't invite Janice? She rubs me the wrong way. Now an entire person like poor Janice can rub you the wrong way, but it also could be something specific that someone said or did. And overall you like Janice, but just that one thing she said or did rubbed you the wrong way. For example, your comment just rubbed me the wrong way. So maybe she said something in a meeting that really annoyed you, but you know she did not intend to annoy you. So here, your comment, this is a noun. Your comment rubbed the past simple of the verb to rub, and notice that soft D, rubbed, rubbed me, rubbed me the wrong way. Wait, is it me? But do I rub you the wrong way? Not Jay. Guy rubs me the wrong way. She rubs everyone the wrong way, but pop. Our final listening exercise and the most advanced, I'll say it three times. I had a hunch he'd quit. I had a hunch he'd quit. I had a hunch he'd quit. Did you get this one? I said, I had a hunch he'd quit. Notice for pronunciation, I had a I had a, had a. So I combine had a together as one word. I had a hunch he'd quit. Now, did you hear that d, he'd, he'd quit? Well, that d represents what word? 
would. He would quit. He'd quit. He'd quit. Very difficult for students to hear. Native speakers understand it based on context and based on grammatical structure. It would sound awkward without it. So we know it's there, even though we can't really hear it either. When you have a hunch, a hunch is the noun, and then the verb that goes with it is have. So to have a hunch, this is when you think or predict that something is going to happen, but it isn't based on facts. It's based on your intuition, your feeling. So you could say, I have a hunch she'll accept our invitation. Now, if someone replies back and says, why? All you would say is, because I have a hunch. <laughs> I have a feeling. I have a gut feeling. And notice the grammar here. I have a hunch. This is the present simple. And then she'll accept. She will accept. That's the future simple. I have a hunch. She'll accept our invitation because you're making a prediction about the future. But you could use this in the past, like our listening exercise. I had a hunch last week in the past, so that's the past simple. Last week, I had a hunch that he would quit. So would is the past simple of the verb will. I had a hunch that he'd quit. And using that is optional. You don't need it. You could simply say, I had a hunch he'd quit. I had a hunch. Just a hunch. <laughs> I had a hunch, but I wasn't certain. Now let's do an imitation exercise so you can practice speaking fast, just like a native. I'll say each sentence again three times. And this time I want you to repeat each sentence out loud. Here we go. Thanks for your help. You rock. Thanks for your help. You rock. Thanks for your help. You rock. She's starting to rub off on you. She's starting to rub off on you. She's starting to rub off on you. He rubs me the wrong way. He rubs me the wrong way. He rubs me the wrong way. I had a hunch he'd quit. I had a hunch he'd quit. I had a hunch he'd quit. Do you want me to make more lessons where we test your listening skills? If you do, then put yes, 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 yes in the comments below. And of course, make sure you like this video, share it with your friends and subscribe so you're notified every time I post a new lesson. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And why don't you keep adding idioms to your expression because they will help you understand native speakers, you can learn 20 common ones right now.